Okay, before I start the lecture, I'd just like to um, uh, make say a point to recognize that the come on in, no problem. Um, the material we're talking about this afternoon is tough. No? It's uh, the case studies that I'm going to refer to are quite harrowing. Um, so if any of you you know, perhaps personally you've had some experience of, of trauma or grief and or grief. I just wanted to say to you there's a potential you could get triggered. Uh, our discussions could rub salt in the wound. Um, so I'd invite you to just be a bit aware of that and, and do some self-care. If you feel like you need to step out for a bit, that's fine. Or uh, if you want to tune out my voice, that's fine, and just concentrate on, on the theoretical bits. But I just think it's important. I just wanted to say something like that, because um, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge. And of course, just because our topic is potentially heavy, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we should avoid it. In fact, it's precisely because it's heavy and it's often not talked about in the public arena. But I think opportunities like this, is, is, it's, a good one. it's a good opportunity. And I think there's something really inspiring about facing, um, facing emotionally difficult stuff. And in particular, recognizing how, how grief is very much a shared human emotion. I mean, we all are going to face grief in our life. Um, so I guess I'm saying we need to be kind and compassionate to ourselves and to each other today um, and recognize this is something we're all sharing at different levels. Okay, so thinking about traumatic grief then. So through my work as a, a psychotherapist, I've become familiar with this territory of grief. And today I'd like to share some of my thinking and my experience of what I'm calling traumatic grief. Now, my analysis of the structure of traumatic grief uh, and the elements that seem figural to it have emerged largely out of my clinical case casework. But it's also emerged out of some previous research I've done um, with my colleague, Barbara Payman on traumatic abortion. Um, and it's also been informed by my philosophical understandings, and in particular, the phenomenological lens that I've used. And this is work in progress. Um, I'm still evolving my ideas, uh, and so I'd really uh, I'd appreciate some discussion and challenge to deepen my philosophical thinking. I mean, one interesting question that's lurking um, which we might uh, address at the end, is whether or not this phenomena of traumatic grief is something different from normal grief, or whether it's just part of the, some, the same continuum, you know, more extreme, persistent version. And I'm also interested to continue a dialogue about how philosophy can offer the therapy world something, <laughs> as well as maybe wondering if there's something that the therapy world can offer philosophy. So hopefully we'll get time to talk about these things. Starting off just with uh, some definitions, what I'm calling uh, traumatic grief. It's basically combining grief and trauma. Uh, I see it as probably located at the extreme end of the spectrum, of the grief spectrum. And this uh, intense form of grief has acquired various names, and it's referred to in different ways. Prolonged grief, disorder, complicated grief, blah, blah, blah. There, there are loads of different, different labels. Among them, we have bereavement-related post-traumatic stress disorder, or disenfranchised grief, which is where the grief isn't given sufficient narrative um, and social recognition. Or there's complicated grief, which is the official term, which previously replaced terms like abnormal grief and pathological grief. So there's lots of names floating around. I should draw your attention to one particular label, 
which is prolonged grief disorder. Um, this, and I, and I mention it because it's been newly included in the International Classification of Diseases um, uh, in 2018, and also in the text version of the DSM, uh, which is the manual that psychiatrists use to make diagnoses, particularly in, in the United States. Um, so that's, that's happened this year. So this is the kind of the hot, ter the hot terminology now. And the defining feature of prolonged grief disorder is the intense longings, preoccupations, depth of emotional pain and numbness. And importantly, these don't abate over time. Um, and they continue to cause severe distress and impairment in different areas of functioning. Um, and we have all sorts of uh, uh, symptoms associated with it. Um, we'll probably be referring to some of these uh, through my talk, but the idea of identity disruption, um, avoidance, intense emotional pain, feeling numb, these are all the, the, the symptoms that have been identified. And what's interesting is that the research on these kinds of symptoms and on this disorder has revealed actually few differences between uh, prolonged grief disorder and so-called normal grief. Um, however, they uh, studied, the most recent study is by Reed et al. in 2022. And they found um, typically only about two to three percent of those uh, experiencing grieving are, are likely to fall into this more problematic category. Um, even considering more extreme cases. So for example, the, the proportion appears to be quite small for, um, they were looking at about 16 percent of refugees fleeing um, war zones, they come under this category. So we are talking about something that is on the extreme end. But for me, I see it all as one, one uh, spectrum, and I think all of these symptoms are, are there uh, in grief as well to different degrees. And I'd say it's important to recognize that diagnostic categories like this are socially constructed, they're not fact. Um, they're subject to constant revision and lots of debate. I mean, for instance, at what point does a prolonged grief response turn into a disorder? Um, or you know, after a year, three years? You know, how how do we make these judgments? And and there's some that would argue against the idea that the persistence of grief is a problem at all. It's, it, it, they would argue against it being pathology. Um, and then there are other debates, like what's the overlap between PTSD and this, or depression and this. And so it, it's a bit of a minefield, the, this language. And for that reason, I'm not going, I'm not going to touch this. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to move away from a medical model perspective. Um, and in any case, personally, I find it's has too much of a reductionist pathologizing uh, focus on symptoms, which results in prescriptions, which I'm not, not so happy about. Um, so instead, I want to draw your attention to individuals you know, and how they live their lives and how they're impacted. And by settling on this term, this kind of made up term, traumatic grief, I'm attempting to bypass the official categories and and the kind of just diagnostic certitude. Instead, I'm trying to emphasize the ambiguity, the ambivalence, the variability of human experience. So, to this end, I'm going to use four fictional exemplar studies to illustrate something of the range of this traumatic grief that we're talking about. Now, they're based on real people real life people, in fact, who've been clients of mine. But I've changed details in order to preserve their identities and 
and just be sensitive, you know, not, I don't want to turn my clients into objects, you know. Um, I'm offering what Irvin Yalom calls symbolic equivalence. So if you, if you bear with me. Okay, so let me introduce these individuals to you. And by the way, are you okay there? Behind the, do you want to, do you want to come over here? Just, yeah, I just, I feel like, yeah, yeah. No, no, can we, I keep thinking I need to invite you over here, so yeah. Okay, let me introduce you to these four people then. Got some more people coming in. Okay, we have, first of all, George. He's a 70-year-old man who lost his wife to COVID. George feels responsible for her death. He says he murdered her. In fact, it seems he may have inadvertently given his wife COVID, uh, following which she was admitted to hospital, but he wasn't able to visit her because he was still testing positive. And then she died in hospital. So he's still confused about what happened, you know, and including exactly how her body was stored, particularly given at that time the hospital morgue was full. A year or so later, he continued to have nightmares. And he says the only time he feels alive is when he senses she is around. He calls this, he, he calls his life dead time. So that's the first first person I want to introduce you to. Secondly, we have Mohammed. He's a 35-year-old refugee who fled Syria 10 years ago after being imprisoned and tortured. Now settled in the UK, he lives alone, he works a lot. He's a highly driven individual. During the day, he works for a minimum wage in a paint factory, and that's despite having an engineering degree. Um, and at night, he drives a taxi. He's cut himself off from his past, and he just refuses to talk about it. He says he's moved on, he has a different life now, and he's become a kind of, his new identity is a sort of isolated, autonomous British person. Uh, and it's his way of coping with uh, the deaths of family members who were massacred and the loss of his homeland, to which it seems like he can never return. So, so they're not easy stories, are they? Okay, third one, Lena. She's a 40-year-old Polish Catholic woman whose husband hanged himself in their bedroom five years ago. The suicide came as a complete shock to her. He seemed well and their marriage seemed sound. Five years on, she remains confused. <laughs> troubled, she's unable to make sense of it all. Sometimes she's angry with him, sometimes at other times she, she punishes herself, she's angry with herself. And both responses leave her unable to trust anybody really, including herself and her judgment. And then finally there's Alex. She's a 65-year-old woman who, uh, when she was in her 20s, was a victim of domestic abuse and she had an abortion. And at the time, she already had two children, and she got pregnant again as a result of what she called marital rape. She went against all her values and had an abortion because she didn't, want, she didn't feel able to protect her baby from her husband's violence. However, the idea that she'd had this abortion was so horrific to her, she repressed the experience. And it, she only kind of remembered it 40 years later when she came into therapy about a completely different thing. She, she came into therapy about her daughter. And then this surfaced. Her, her previously disowned grief was now present and she was inconsolable about it. I'm interested to hear, maybe when we have the discussion, which of these stories impact you particularly or the most, um, and maybe all of them. Um, uh, yeah, not easy material, as I said at the beginning. 
Okay, let me move on to the uh, talking a little bit about my research methodology. It can, it can be broadly described as reflexive hermeneutic phenomenology, where I'm really focusing on the here and now um, embodied intersubjective experiencing of the individuals in their world, in their life world. So as I said before, the data has come from my client work um, over decades. Um, and also, uh, it's come from my research that I did with Barbara Payman on, on this traumatic abortion. So Alex, the last vignette, came from that study. Um, OK, and then the analysis. It's basically an existential thematic analysis, um, also drawing on very much intersubjective and philosophical reflection based on discussions with many, many clients, colleagues, uh, uh, my supervisors, uh, just and, and also my co-researcher in the abortion study, research participants. So it, there's a lot of discussions that kind of underpin um, where I've gone on this. OK, so let's think about some of my findings then. I think in general, um, with grief, we already know there's a radical sense of disconnection from the world. Uh, the significance of one's life world disintegrates, while one's sense of belonging in and to the wider world is destabilized. There's a disorientation, a loss of taking for granted meanings as the familiar becomes strange uh, and, and, and the strange becomes familiar. I mean, previous research describes all this really well. I mean, in particular, Matthew Radcliffe's uh, work and, and in, with his team on, on grief. Um, uh, these are the kind of themes that are talked about a lot. And I think this quotation from Romanishan really captures it well. He says, when she died, my life was shattered. This, is when he, um, this was his grief about losing his wife. When she died, my life shattered like a pane of fragile glass. In a single moment, in the space between two heartbeats, everything that I ever was and everything that I wanted to be was erased. In the interval between the moment just before her death and the moment just after it, a black hole opened in my soul and sucked it into the past what we had made together and the future we were dreaming. He also writes in his book, um, The Soul in Grief, that the sudden death of his wife shattered the familiar contours of, of his world, such that the ordinary things in life seem strange. I think as Matthew Radcliffe has put in his book on, on grief, there's a pr profound sense of being lost. You know, it's not that the right path can't be found, it's just that the familiar paths have simply disappeared. So this, this disconnection, disintegration, disorientation was revealed in four emergent themes um, from my reflections. And I've, called, I've titled them these, and, and the, the exemplar case studies kind of helped, helped formulate these themes. So my themes are a rupture of temporal narratives, Dissociative world distancing disconnection, shameful shaming silences, and then finally living with ghostly presences. And I'm, I'll um, talk about each of those in turn. Okay, starting first with the rupture of temporal narratives. We know grief can disrupt the flow of time in different ways to different depths. Like Fuchs, for example, has written that in grief, the time of the mourner slows down and they become fixated on the past. He notes the temporal desynchronization where the mourner becomes increasingly disconnected from the present. You know, the rift between the time of the mourner and the world time creates a conflict between, it's kind of like the deceased's 
presence in the past and their absence in the present. In the present. So um, Ratcliffe has talked about the momentum of temporal, potential, retentional structure. Hard to say that all. Um, so for those of non-phenomenologists here, basically this is where the systems of anticipation which shape our perceptual experience and how we approach the world and they guide our actions, they disappear, they, they're disrupted. Um, I think uh, also for the non-phenomenologists, let, let me uh, give a user-friendly example of uh, any Harry Potter fans here? Port, port key? Okay, so I've got some nods there. Okay, those of you who don't know what a port key is, um, not versed in Harry Potter world, a port key is an object on which a spell has been cast and it enables it to transport an individual to another place in an instant. Very cool. Port keys to trauma keep us returning to the original trauma. Uh, so with grief, we can experience being transported back to multiple other griefs suffered in the past. So in, in any time you're hearing about somebody's grief now, what's also there is the other griefs in the past. And it's, you know, it's complicated. Emily Hughes has uh, also written on this, this topic. And she notes how the desynchronization can unfold in different ways. In its mildest form, live time seems to slow down or speed up. And then moving up the intensity scale, the disconnects increase. And then upon reaching the most profound, intense uh, expression, I think she describes it well, desynchronization affects a complete disconnect between the time of the mourner and the time of the world, with the time of the mourner coming to a standstill, such that one finds oneself beyond time, which is experienced as meaningless or unreal. Here, the dimensions of the past, present, and future are closed off as a whole and experienced as if from the outside. So this profound level is what I've observed with, with my clients who are, who are experiencing traumatic grief, traumatic grief. They talk about time freeze phrasing, framing or coming to a standstill when the rest of their life moves on, um, moves on without them. Um, do you, and do you know what? I think in the pandemic, I think we experienced a bit of this too, you know, that we had a strange sense of time. Things were took, seemed to go, go very slowly or went very speedily. It was, it, it was just odd for, for people. Okay, importantly, this fractured time is lived out uh, in different ways. So for both, both George and Muhammad, if we go back to my vignettes, they both had a radical change in their circumstances which precipitated a profound disorientation. So they suffered a fracturing of their identity that can only be managed by staying in either the past or the present. So for George, time without his beloved is so meaningless, he's calling it dead time. Uh, he only comes back to life when he feels his dead wife's presence. You know, his choice then is to weave a narrative that he's still with his wife, or if she's dead, so is he. For Muhammad, unable to handle past, present disconnects, the, I mean, you, know, you think about the trauma of his experience of a, as a refugee, but also the pain of his losses, his, his home, his culture, all of it. Um, in order to cope with all that, he constructs him his, this new identity in the present. So he's intensely focused on the now and working. And it's as if the past and the future can kind of be airbrushed away. So he, his compulsive working isn't really to make money for a better future. It's more to be safer in the now. Um, so for these individuals, there's a kind of collapse of past, present, and future. 
And the rupture involves such a profound disorientation that making sense of it all, all involves these two men in rewriting their narrative history or their narrative identity. So George becomes a murderer. You know, at least that in his own mind. You know, while at the same time he keeps his wife alive to sort of retain his old self. Muhammad becomes a British factory worker, taxi driver. He cuts off all links with his previous identity as a Syrian husband, brother, engineer. So Matthew um, and Ellie Byrne have written a lot about this, this temp this this uh, this temporal desynchronization and how it links up with the narrative. And they note that the phenomenological disturbance in grief involves a diminution of self, of who one is, along with the disruption of our everyday life projects. They argue that the narratives can help keep at bay the indeterminacy of grief, and they provide a structure which could be provisional or enduring to help make sense of what's happened and what's happening, and to negotiate this disturbance and to restore a coherent life structure, the grief is navigated by imposing a new structure on it, a new narrative structure. So um, this is one of the quotes from their paper. Um, I'm still who I was, and yet that identity is no longer sustainable. I cannot be that person anymore, but have no other identity. One's current sense of self is profoundly eroded. Norms and significant possibilities that would ordinarily constrain or even specify patterns of thought and activity are lacking. Now, what this all highlights for me, and this, as a psychotherapist, this is a really key point, is that grief is a continuing process of sense-making. You know, and that has profound implications for therapy. Rather than seeking to help clients work through their grief or somehow get rid of the grief or make the grief better, um, rather than that, we should be thinking about, you know, I think we're more effectively occupied helping the person um, work through their process, um, but, but more, more about acting, um, acting as a witness to their process. Think, we need to be accompanying clients in their efforts to make sense of the ruptured temporal and narrative indeterminacy of their experience. So, so speaking as a therapist, I could say that I really I appreciate these philosophical insights because they've nudged my work in, in different directions. Um, in particular, I never talk about work through the grief as, as like some, somehow you can kind of do this. Okay, let me move on to... Um, next thing. Dissociative world distancing disconnection. I don't know why I went, on, went for all this alliteration. It actually makes it really hard to speak when you're doing a lecture, but there we are. Okay. The dissociation that arises with traumatic grief includes the sense that one's disconnected from one's body. You know, there, there are often feelings of numbness or somehow being separate from the world. And psychologists understand this, um, this dissociation as an adaptive survival mechanism. You know, in the face of an externally threatening um, experience from which there's no physical escape, we do the next best thing, which is psychologically escape. I mean, it's just, to me, it's wondrous when I see that happening. Um, in contrast to, say, healthy versions of dissociation, like, like uh, getting lost in a good book or compartmentalizing, um, those are good, good forms of dissociation. I think um, traumatic grief involves a radical disconnection with one's self and one's relationship to oneself. So as Stolero notes, there's a narrowing of the horizons of emotional experience, something which enables the grief-stricken to exclude whatever feels unacceptable or unbearable. So in therapy, the most common form of um, dissociation seen in survivors of complex trauma 
is what we call structural dissociation or splits, vertical splits in consciousness. And here a split is apparent between often you get seemingly high functioning parts of the person um, and aspects of themselves. Um, and then there are other aspects which are locked in this traumatic re-experiencing. Uh, flashbacks, nightmares, hyperarousal, and the split can be, you know, you, you would meet somebody who seems very, you know, absolutely fine, very calm, but you're not seeing that, that other bit that's been split off. So on the surface, the person may function very well, perhaps they intellectualize a bit or they cut off from their feelings a bit, but it's the other parts that are much more obviously vulnerable, unable to emotionally regulate, insecurely dependent on others. And at this extreme end of the, the spectrum, we get uh, what we call dissociative identity disorder. And this is where you have alters who, um, who kind of carry the repressed memories or the, the trauma memories. Um, but this splitting and self-dissociation involves more than an inner dynamic. It's not something happening inside. As we know from phenomenology, Merleau-Ponty famously said, um, there is no inner man. Only in the world does he know himself. It's an important point. Disconnection where the self or parts of self is engaged in self-protectively effective work withdrawing effectively from the world you know so then what we see here is not just the self it's withdrawing from the world as well dissociating from the world so Kuster um, has described this as a world distancing movement and he says it's experienced as being in a bubble or as if enclosed in a kind of membrane in which the bereaved is shielded from the intrusiveness of the world. Uh, the bereaved writer C.S. Lewis similarly uh, talks about it. He, he, when his, uh, uh, his wife died, he talked about the invisible blanket between the world and me. But we need to look at the implications of this invisible blanket. You know, if you think about it, the, when parts of yourself remain unseen and untalked to, there's a disruption in the embodied interconnections with others. You know, for Kusta, this, this con the consequence of this lack of vital contact with the world, in, with these parts, can be profound. And he talks, he talks about painful existential loneliness. And that's, that's often a big thing that, that people talk about. They feel so lonely, and they feel so lonely because those parts of them aren't talked to. They, they are alone. In, in fact, fact, they've, they've been, been um, uh, also abandoned by the, the self sometimes. So in the case of my vignettes, we can see how Muhammad splits himself into Syrian and British personas, consciously or unconsciously, or Alex dissociates from her repressed memories of the abuse and the abortion. Ensuring her traumatized part is carefully sequestered, she can carry on living. By splitting, she effectively disowns the bad mother part of her, which then allows her to hold on to, actually she's a good mother too for her two other kids. Um, but when she gets in touch with that disowned part, she's inconsolable. So during her interview uh, for the abortion study, she, um, she talked about this, and, and it was quite interesting the way she shifted from the first person to second person, and even third person voice. So I'll, I'll just say a few things about what she said uh, in the interview. She said, that's the hardest thing, that I'm responsible for it, and she's sobbing. And I don't know if I'm crying for me or crying for forgiveness, but certainly it's really painful. It's like you committed some awful crime. You have killed something. You have killed something. All those things come to your mind again when you've got to shut it out. You can't think it's a real living being. You can't. It was a terrible thing I had to do. Um, 
I didn't really want to do it, more sobbing. I deal with most things in life as being very controlled and locking away into compartments. So the interviewer says you were somehow detached from it, protecting yourself. Alex says, yes, because I'd learned to do that. Here you are like on, on like aut automatic pilot. You do the normal things, like you go to the bathroom, you have your breakfast, it's unreal. You go to sleep and you wake up and it's unreal. You want it to be unreal, but you can't escape from it. I'd been well in control all these years. It was like I, it had a lid on it. It had been tucked away. I didn't really grieve properly. I suppose because I had to pretend it like never happened. So for Alex, we can see that keeping a lid on her traumatic past means that she'd never been able to grieve properly or, and this is the key, or to have that part of her nurtured, cared for by others. So pretending all is well was a way of coping, but with such a mask in place, she could flee her traumatic experience but she cuts off from the world. She effectively abandons her younger self and stops other people talking to that younger self as well. So during the course of therapy, that was very much what we were working with, um, working with these different parts. And Alex and I talked about how her, that rejected part of her was devoid of any human loving connection and how even Alex herself had turned away. And we worked on her connecting with that part with compassion, not persecution. And that was the key. Uh, and th that's a very typical example of the kind of trauma work that uh, therapists engage. And that leads on to the next uh, theme. Of shameful, doing it again, shameful shaming silences. Um, this is a good quote from Bradshaw, uh, really describing that sense of shame. He says, when shame is toxic, it is an excruciatingly internal experience of unexpected exposure. It's a deep cut felt primarily from the inside. It divides us from ourselves and from others. Shame lurks in all the stories of people uh, experiencing traumatic grief. Um, George believes he's a murderer, something that's likely to be with him for the rest of his life, I suspect. Muhammad doesn't want to speak about the atrocities he's witnessed, um, and somehow he feels guilty about them. His silence is loud. Lena struggles to reveal to others that her husband committed suicide. You know, to admit this also admits, it, it also means admitting to herself and to others what a bad wife she was. You know, or at least in her mind. So she keeps it mostly a secret. Even those who know what happened, like there was a suicide, they don't grasp the depth of her angry, confused, shamed feelings. And this is the source of her disenfranchised grief, where it's just not given sufficient narrative and social recognition. Okay, the, the shame and secrecy surrounding all these individuals and their stories, I think, can be regarded as an existential feeling. Uh, Matthew Radcliffe has written about this. Um, it seems to me that shame gives meaning to the world. It embodies a style of anticipation, a background orientation where self and world are experientially related. Um, it's kind of always there as a blanket. Shame, as I see it, constitutes an enduring, pervasive mood which is taken for granted. Living her shame, Alex experiences her world as bad, but her world is also one that tells her she's bad. And as her badness is revealed in the world, she takes her badness for granted. After the abortion, 
Alex tries to leave that experience behind her. She must hide and protect herself from the shaming looks of others who are critical of her. Um, she tell her she's done something wrong, that she's bad. Now, Jean-Paul Sartre, the um, uh, phenomenologist and writer, he's argued, when we become aware of somebody, lo somebody else looking at us, we become aware of ourselves as an object. And with this profoundly objectifying look that's cast by the other, we're kind of denied, we're denied existence as a subject. And then we can feel alienated and judged. And that's the kind of process of, of shame that, that I'm talking about. Naked and exposed to the world, Alex clothes herself in an inauthentic veneer. She defends and protects herself through secrecy and denial, at least in the years before therapy. She doesn't want to be reminded of her badness, just as she doesn't want others to see it. But then she's cut off from the loving care that she could receive. So that's a big thing. Just looking at the time. OK, I'll, I'll take a 10 more minutes. OK, fourth thing, living with ghostly presences. Uh, actually, this might be my favorite theme. Uh, do, you, do you like this theme? Not sure, not sure. OK, OK. Um, well, what I can say is this theme manifests in lots of elusive, divergent ways. Uh, the theme presented itself to me when I tuned into the possibility that the griever was experiencing continuing bombs. And Klaus Silverman and Nickman put forward this, at the time, quite radical idea that maintaining ongoing bombs with deceased loved ones is consistent with healthy adjustments to bereavement, and that the elimination of attachments to the dead, dead person shouldn't be the therapeutic goal. You know, and that went against the prevailing orthodoxy from Freud onwards. Instead, it seems that the continuing relationship with the deceased can and should be nurtured, even as stories get revised. And this allows an ongoing connection with the dead to emerge. So Higgins similarly argues that closure to grief isn't obligatory as love continues after death and we continue our attachment to loved ones symbolically. And I really like uh, when she says in particular, we need stories, narratives to reanimate the dead. I like that quote. OK, and that's the job in therapy. You know. um, from this, perspective, from this perspective, the process of grieving involves an ongoing navigation of connection and separation. For George, his continuing bonds are evident. He wants, needs, maybe, to continue his dialogue with his deceased wife. You know, he needs that in order to feel alive. Um, he's yet to find a way of weaving a more durable narrative of, of, of living where his wife can be present. Um, or absent while he continues to live in the world. For now, in a sense, he has become the ghost to his living wife. You know, or perhaps a different interpretation might be he sees himself as a murderer by and doing so he inserts himself in her in the story of her her death and so he maintains a continuing link. In a story with more somber tones, Lena has also continued having a relationship with her husband. Uh, she spends hours in silent entreaty, asking her husband why? Why? What should I have done differently? Her Catholic upbringing tells her that her husband committed a mortal sin. And she struggles with wondering about the fate and whereabouts of his soul. You know, and also how maybe the dead souls of her family going back generations, you know, they might reject them both. You know, is he the one that's the sinner or is it herself, the apparently inadequate wife? Had she been a better, more aware wife, might he still be alive? You know, at least then he wouldn't want it to leave her. 
when she said that to me, that was very poignant. You know, these are the kind of questions that, that we were exploring in therapy. Muhammad sever, severed, or as I now see it, corroded uh, connections with his past or, or less clear cut. His cultural heritage, his memory of the massacre, I mean, his fam they, th this all loiters as ghostly presences and untold stories. And I'm reminded here of a um, great chapter written by Jane Speedy on ghost traces, sediments, and accomplices when she talks about therapeutic, uh, psychotherapeutic dialogues. She says, I sit and engage in conversation in a space that over time harbors traces of many entanglements and stories. The worst accumulations are those stories half told or untold. The words awkwardly loitering in the corners, unsaid or unsayable, unacknowledged voices in the memories and histories of therapists and their clients, together with the accumulated residual traces of others, will make for cacophonous conversational spaces full of sedimented traumas and bereavement and populated with ghost voices. I mean, all the, um, all the people in the abortion study uh, were very much caught up with, with, uh, with ghost. And it, and it was the, the ghostly presences of the mother-child bond that, that repeated and were reenacted in different imaginal ways. So one of our uh, participants, Eve, she still sets a table at the family dinner table for, at Christmas for her, her um, uh, lost baby. But it was Mia whose continuing bond showed up most clearly as ghostly, corrupted, intergenerational connection. In the original abortion study, we elaborated the theme of monstrous ma others in an effort to capture the layers of damage, betrayal, and abandonment which had replayed themselves through at least two generations and probably more. So Mia felt she had betrayed her baby and she'd abandoned herself psychically in her dissociation, just as her mother had betrayed and abandoned her, just as her mother similarly rejected by, by her own dismissive mother. And this is what we wrote in, in our report. The concept of monstrous m others offers us an opportunity to explicate phenomenologically something of the ambiguous relational boundaries um, inherent in Mia's experience. We suggest that at some level Mia believes she has been a monstrous mother, one who has birthed a monstrous other, yet refracted in this subjectivity we find ghosted images of her own monstrous mother and her own monstrous self as both a fetus and baby and as a young woman who has chosen to have an abortion and it and the links go on so that seemed uh, an important uh, a theme to try and language although it's hard to pinpoint it exactly okay I'm aware of the time so let me just quickly quickly end here conclusion I've shared my take on traumatic grief combination of grief and trauma. And I think these four themes um, really are captured in, in my four, four vignettes, but also everybody else I've worked with who, with traumatic grief. Um, I think all grief has a traumatic element to it, but I think some individuals stand out given the intensity or the devastating character of the, their experience of loss. And so we need to ask, is their grief different or is it part of this continuum? And this question matters because it guides what kind of therapeutic support the individuals might benefit from. Is it just a question of giving them the normal kind of um, therapy that you'd receive with, uh, 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 with grief? Or do they need something more or different? Guides the nature of the therapeutic support. And I think philosophy can help therapists here. And I wonder if 
therapy has any insights to offer philosophy, but I guess that's the, that's the questions we can kind of deal with now. So I've just, I've left some other questions up on the board uh, in case you'd like to share or think about it. But yeah, Louise, can I hand over to you? Well, I think we should thank you so much. Okay, thank you.